I'm going to read this morning from John 16. I want you to turn there. I want you to read a few of these scriptures with me this morning. Some of them, over the past few weeks, we have read together. <clears throat> so some of them, I'm just going to quote them. For example, Acts chapter 4. I'm just going to discuss that because we've studied it and talked about it. And I just will say it to you. You'll remember it. But I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. We've been doing a message on the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which we talked about last week. And today I want to talk about the mission of the Holy Ghost, the mission of the Holy Spirit. Probably as well as any other part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit's mission has been greatly misunderstood. Um, As a result of His mission being misunderstood, men have tried to manipulate the Holy Ghost for their own purposes. He will not be manipulated. He will not be forced into some particular action or course. He comes for one reason. He's never been distracted from it. Jesus was very disciplined in the earth. When he was here, he said that I only do what my father is doing. I only say what he is saying. Now, that was the discipline of Jesus. And certainly in the discipline of the Holy Ghost, he has not altered, nor has he been distracted from the purpose that he was sent into this world. And he will only do what Jesus is doing. And he will only say what Jesus is saying. He has come to glorify Jesus Christ. In 1727... In Germany, 75, what we call today Moravians, met together and the Holy Ghost was poured out on them. It was a significant move of God in the early 1700s because this would go on to change the course of world missions. It has been fundamentally altered ever since that day in 1727. This Outcry from the Moravians has brought many missionary testimonies and stories. One of the most famous is the slogan that has been derived from them, May the Lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That was certainly the desire and the heart of the Moravian people. But all of that was produced by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because they simply humbled themselves For the Holy Spirit to come and fulfill in them what His mission is in the earth. They did not try to manipulate Him into anything else other than what He has come to do. Well, He did fall upon that group. Zinzendorf said as he commented about the group of Moravians in Germany, he said when they left that meeting after that Holy Ghost had been poured out upon them, it was the happiest group of people I've ever witnessed in my life. They themselves could not tell whether they were still on earth or they had gone to heaven. That is just simply what happens when you have fellowship with God in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that His presence is the fullness of joy. I've said it many times these weeks. i just say it again. If the closest you can get to, to God is the church, then your life is sad indeed. Because it's His presence that is the fullness of joy. And only in the Holy Ghost, by the blood of the Lamb, can you get into His presence. Now that's hopeful, because through the blood of the Lamb, anybody can come. And because it's fellowship in the Spirit, it does not depend upon your education or your might. Just your humility to allow the Holy Spirit to bring you fully into the presence of God. From this outpouring of the Holy Ghost on those Moravians, it has been recorded in history That in 20 short years, these Moravian missionaries did more for world missions than the last 200 years. That's a recorded historical fact. Out of the Moravian Pentecostal revival came the Salvation Army. It came the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And came many other wonderful missionary organizations throughout the world. It had a profound impact upon ministers of the gospel that converted them to Jesus Christ, even though they were preachers of the New Testament. It has been recorded in history that John and Charles Wesley had been in the United States and were traveling back over to Europe on their way home. While they were on the boat, 
There was a tremendous storm that had built up and it was very, very dangerous. It was so dangerous. It was probably a hurricane that even the sailors on the ship were terrified, knowing that they would surely die, that there's no way the ship is going to be able to weather this storm. Well, everybody on the ship was panicked. They were trying to do everything they could to stay afloat. There was a small group of Moravians on the ship, and they were the only ones on the whole ship with peace and joy. They were huddled together, worshiping God, singing hymns and praises to the Lord. And the impact of their witness in that moment was so strong that John Wesley went up to Peter Bolin, who was the head of that Moravian group on the boat, and he said, why are you not praying? And he said, oh, I'm praying a prayer that you don't know of. He said, we are praying, but we're not praying that our lives might be spared. We're praying that our God may be glorified. There's never a greater opportunity for us to bring glory to our God than when everybody else around us is scared. See, everybody can sing when everybody's happy, but John, if anybody's going to be one to Christ to know how great he is, never is our opportunity greater than when everybody else is afraid. And John left and he went to find his brother Charles, only to find that Charles had been converted by those Moravians to Jesus Christ. And Charles had found himself in the midst of those people singing, rejoicing and praising the Lord. Well, John Wesley was so shaken by his converted brother that he knew, because he knew his brother, that what these Moravians had was something he did not have. So he went back to Peter Bolin and he told him, and he said, I've got to talk to you. I've seen my brother Charles converted. I don't understand what's happened to him. I only know this. I do not have what Charles has. I do not have what you have. What must I do? And Peter Boland said to John Wesley, he said, it is all by grace. It is all by grace. And John said to him, he said, I don't have this grace. He said, Mr. Boland, what must I do? Should I stop preaching because I don't have grace? And Peter Boland said, no, John, preach grace because it's in the Bible. Preach it until you get it. And then when you get it, preach it because you have it. And it changed John Wesley's life. And the Moravian Christians had a direct impact upon a denomination that in its heyday was one of the strongest gospel preachers that the world has ever known. And Methodism swept the entire globe, influenced by the Moravians. Those men on that boat saw the conversion of John and Charles Wesley to Jesus Christ by the grace of God. You talk about an impact That they've had upon the world. These Moravians, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, a Pentecostal move of God, the first thing that they did was divide their days up into four hour segments so that they would pray one, that they would pray 24 hours a day, nonstop, unceasingly. And they did this for 100 years. 100 years. Those Moravians prayed unceasing, 24 hours a day, laboring before God. I'm going to tell you something. Only the Holy Ghost can move a people to live before God like that. Because you see, you're not going to worship what you don't see. You're not going to worship an ideal. You're not going to worship doctrine. You're going to worship Jesus that you see. And if you don't see him, You won't worship Him. And you'll never see Him apart from the Holy Ghost. He's the only one that can show Him. And part of His mission in the earth is to take what belongs to Jesus and show it to us. Oh, I do pray that all of us would see today our Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, I'm sorry, John 16, verse 14, Jesus said, He shall glorify me. That sums up the mission of the Holy Ghost in this earth. 
He's going to convict of sin in order to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to bring judgment in order to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to save to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to forgive sin in order to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to heal to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to put broken lives together to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to fall upon every hungry heart to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to preach through the preacher to glorify Jesus Christ. He's going to heal to glorify Jesus Christ. He has come to glorify me. That's what Jesus said. Now, I've said this enough, but I believe it just bears repeating this morning. I want you to understand the Holy Ghost is God. He's not a force. He's not an impersonal being. He has an extreme personality. The Bible says that he can be grieved. He can be offended. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit can and often does withdraw himself from the very people he's come to fill. He'll do all of these things. He has a personality. He is the person of God. He is the third person of the Godhead. There are three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. I would take nothing away from the Holy Spirit in regards of worship. I believe it is appropriate to worship the Holy Ghost as you would worship Jesus or worship the Father. I believe it is appropriate to ask for the Holy Spirit to give you strength and assistance and recognize Him and fellowship with Him because the Bible says that our fellowship is with God in the Holy Ghost. Well, you must have fellowship with the Holy Ghost if you're to have fellowship with the Father and with His Son. It is the means by which we have fellowship with Him. It's appropriate to talk about the Holy Spirit. It's appropriate to understand the Holy Spirit. It's appropriate to respect the Holy Spirit. It's appropriate to honor the Holy Spirit. It's appropriate to draw attention to the Holy Spirit. But never forget this, that when it is a move of the Spirit, He always, always brings all of the attention on Jesus. Always. He does not come to bring the attention upon Himself. He brings it upon Jesus Christ. Whenever it begins to move in another direction, which we have seen historically in Pentecostal revivals, whenever it begins to move in another direction, whenever men become the predominant subject or figure of it, the Holy Spirit will withdraw and the revival will begin to dwindle because it can only be sustained by Him. But how often does this happen because of the carnality of man? God brings revival. We've seen it. The Moravians had their revival. We had the Azusa Street revival. We saw the revival in Swansea in 1905 and 6. In in Wales, we saw all these things. But it's always been hijacked along the way. Somebody wants to be the preacher of the revival. Somebody wants to be the one with the credit for the miracles. Somebody wants this position. Somebody wants that position. It all happened because everybody wanted Jesus and the Holy Ghost fell on that. But the corruption of man always has to dabble with it and touch it and want something for himself. And whenever that happens, the Holy Spirit withdraws and it begins to dwindle and he searches for another people who are hungry. I pray that you're hungry this morning for Jesus Christ. If you are, the Holy Ghost will satisfy you. He will. Now, the mission of the Holy Ghost is to make the name of Jesus great in the earth. That is his mission. That's what he's come to do. He is not interested in making a name for First New Testament Church. He's not interested in making a name for the School of Christ. He's not interested in making a name for Lee Ship. He's not interested in making a name for Billy Graham. He's not interested in making a name out of any man. He has come to make the name of Jesus great in this earth. Now, if you look in biblical history you will find that these are the men and women who had the greatest impact upon nations, generations, and generations to come. It was men and women consumed with one thing, and that was the name of God. These people, all the way back in the Old Testament times, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, others, Enoch, none more than Moses, understood the jealousy that God had for his name. Jeremiah understood this all too well, and he knew because of the jealousy of God's name, he said to God, we are your people, though we are filled with iniquity, God, because we are your people and your name is associated with us. 
do not forsake us. How often did Moses plead with God based upon the merits of God's own name? God said, I want to destroy the Israelites. Moses interceded on behalf of them for God. Moses, one of the greatest times of intercession Moses had with God is when God wanted to wipe Israel out. And Moses went before God and he simply talked to God along these lines. If you do this and you destroy this people and you raise up a nation out of me and you don't get these people from Egypt to this promised land that you promised to their fathers, what will the nations say about you? And that moved God. And it moved God so mightily that God repented himself for what he was going to do. And Moses had gained a place of intercession with God because the only thing Moses was consumed with was the name of God. Samuel was a prophet in Israel who lived for that name as well. He did nothing but for the name of God. He wanted to make the name of God great. In a day when Israel had lost its way, Could not discern any longer who was God. Is it Baal or is it the God of Abraham? They did not know any more. They had 850 witches who had went through the land of Israel saying to everyone that Baal was God. They had killed anyone who tried to defy that. Then out comes a man from obscurity. Nobody knew him. He didn't come up through the rank and files of the modern prophets or anything like that. But he steps onto the scene All for the name of God. He lived to make God great in the earth. Well, this was always the people that the Holy Ghost came upon. He didn't come upon anybody else. He didn't come upon people because they had good intentions. He didn't come upon people because they had a desire to be humanitarians and ease the load of their brothers and their neighbors. He came upon people who wanted to make the name of God great in the earth. And he found those people and came upon them. Thus, you have the great prophets, you have the great martyrs, you have the great preachers in the Bible. They all did this. In the New Testament, it is no different. This is where you see the great anointing of God. This is why the Holy Ghost has come for the name of Jesus Christ to be great in the earth, to be great in every generation. When that is your sole desire, I promise you the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And there will be a testimony through your life of the greatness of Jesus Christ. But he will not mix it and he will not share your glory with him. It has to be all for his glory. In John 3, 1, 7, I'll just say it, very short phrase. It says, for his namesake, they went forth. For his namesake, they went forth. It's never changed. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, it has never changed. It is for his namesake to make his name great in the earth. Now, I just read this little passage of, to you about God's contest with Egypt while Israel was slaves there. And the Bible tells us in Exodus, it says, And in very deed, for this cause have I raised you up, for to show in you my power, And that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. I've raised you up for one thing. So that I can show through you my power for this end result. That my name will be great in the earth. No other reason. That's it. You may die for this. You may be persecuted for this. You may be hated for this. But if you live for the glory of my name, then that doesn't matter to you. And if it doesn't matter to you, then I can show my power through you and my name will be great in the earth again. And so God goes into Egypt with a man that was willing to be that man for God. And the name of God became great in the earth. The name of God filled the earth and struck terror in all of God's enemies. As a matter of fact, when they approached the promised land and they had sent spies into the land, they were about to come into the land to take the land as their promise. Then one woman in Jericho made this statement. Now, listen, this is the fame of God because one man at a burning bush was defeated by God and said, I'll be that man. I can't speak, but you speak through me. I don't know how this is going to happen, but do it through me. I want your name to be great in the earth. Who are you that I might tell people about you? I don't want to go in Moses' name. I don't want to go in Aaron's name. I've got to go in your name. What is your name? You see the passion right there from the very beginning. Well, this one man 
in a very short time, spread the fame of God throughout his generation, even into other nations. This woman says to the Israelites, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sahan and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. And so this was the fame and the reputation of God that went into the earth because one man was willing to be whatever God needed him to be in order that his name would be great in the earth. 400 years of silence from God. Suddenly the silence is broken by such a loud ministry. This isn't unique. There was 400 years of silence after Malachi, the prophet, until John the Baptist. And God, when he came, he did not come with a whisper, but he came with a thunder. John the Baptist thundered from the Judean hills, preparing the people for the way of the Lord because he was coming. And when Jesus came down those hills and stepped into that Jordan River, John the Baptist, with all the thunderings that the Holy Ghost could give a man, preached to thousands and thousands and thousands of people on that seashore. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what was John the Baptist's passion? It was the same passion as Moses and Samuel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Enoch and all of the rest of them. I must decrease and he must increase. I'm telling you something, people. That's the person the Holy Ghost fills. That is the person that the Holy Ghost comes upon. We become so professional in our ministries. We, we just put it in. We put it out. We want something from it for ourselves. We want some type of recognition. We want people to love us. We want people to accept us. We want to be popular. We want to be wealthy. No wonder the Holy Ghost takes a back seat. And we wonder where is His power? Where is the authority of God? Where are the conviction of souls? He's waiting for a man, a woman, a boy or a girl who will say to him, I want to live for one reason, and that is to make the name of Jesus great in this earth again. And if it's by life or death, so be it. But I want to live for that reason. That is who he's looking for, and he looks for no other. Now, the Holy Spirit is very, if if I could use the word, excited. He's very excited to provide a demonstration of Jesus' being alive. He wants to do it. We've read this in Acts chapter 4, how Peter and John passed this man who's crippled, crippled from birth. He was carried everywhere, everywhere he ever went. People had to carry him. Everybody in the town knew him. They knew he was a cripple from a baby. All the way now, he's an adult man. He couldn't move around by himself. And then one day, the Holy Ghost moves in Peter and John. And they simply tell the man, we don't have any money, but we've got something greater than that. We have Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. It was a command because it was the Holy Ghost speaking. You know, men would have laid hands on him and asked the Lord, would you please heal him? Well, the Holy Ghost never prays like that. When the Holy Ghost fills you, now you may pray like that over circumstances and situations that you don't know, but when the Holy Ghost fills you, He is never going to pray, will you please do something? He knows the mind of God. He knows what Jesus is doing, and He issues a command, rise up and walk. And he told Peter and John in that they speak to this man, issue a command, and the lame man gets up and he walks, never walked before in his life. I mean, not only are his legs healed, his muscles are there, and he has the ability to keep his balance and walk around. It's a miracle all the way through. Well, they take Peter and John, bring them before the courts, bring them before the religious leaders of their day. And the religious leaders want to know one thing, by what name or what authority did you do this in? And then the Bible says, and being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I just love that because the Holy Spirit did all of this and he's not going to let a man ruin this now. And so the Holy Ghost speaks through Peter and the Holy Spirit says, the one you crucified that I have raised up, the cornerstone that you have rejected, 
The name by which men must be saved, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is the reason this man is whole and walking around here today. I, the Holy Ghost, am given proof and evidence that Jesus, you crucified, I have raised up. He is alive. Now, how did the Holy Spirit produce that? He did it through men like you and me. They were just simply instruments by which the Holy Ghost could move. He's still in the earth to do that today. What other power is going to challenge Rome? What other power is going to silence the great authorities of government? What other powers are going to deal with the occultism that was in the Greek world in that day? What other power is going to do it but the power of the Holy Ghost? In their day, they were not afforded the luxury of soft speeches and nice little sermons. They had to cut into the hearts of the men and women who handed over the Prince of Life in order that he might be crucified. They rejected the Son of God. And these men and women of the New Testament Acts had to go to those very men and women and declare the Christ you crucified. God has raised up and given him a name above every name. What man or woman has the courage to do something like that? Not only the courage, but how else is anybody going to get past their past to even do it? You and I know all too well the power of sin upon us. We all know too well how easy your past is able to trip you up from doing anything good for God. God wants to use it. You want to be used of God. And just as soon as those desires are met together, there is the devil bringing up your past. And the devil brings your past up. How dare you? Who do you think you are? You're not worthy to represent God. You're not holy to represent God. You're not strong enough and mighty enough. But what I read in the New Testament Scriptures and in the Old Testament, God's not looking for power. He's looking for weakness. God's not looking for people who have their life all put together. He's looking for people whose lives are scattered. They can't put it back together. They trust a living God who will. And God takes weakness so that He can demonstrate His power. Oh, that's what he does. There's a stammering Moses who says to God, we make him great. He never made himself great. A stammering Moses says to a living God, I can't even speak. You've got the wrong man. God says, I know who I've got. I made your tongue. I will use it. God was able. He was a weak man. He wasn't a strong man. God comes to Gideon and he says, oh, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said to the angel, you've got the wrong man. I'm not a mighty man of valor. I'm the least in my father's house. And if I was so courageous, why would I be treading out the wheat in the wine press so that I wouldn't be caught? I'm not a strong man. I'm not a courageous man. And God said to Gideon, don't you tell me who or what you are. I'm going to make you that mighty man. Jeremiah says to God, I'm too young. I'm just a kid. Nobody's going to listen to me, God. I'm just a child. God interrupts him, says, don't you tell me what you are. When I fashioned you in your mother's womb, I know what I was making you. I know where I'm sending you. You will stand before kings, Jeremiah, and I will give you the word to speak. And he did. He did it. Paul was great because he was weak. We make him great. He made himself weak. Paul said, I'm a weak man. Don't make me a great man. Don't think that my success was my intelligence. Don't think that my zeal was the reason churches were produced in Corinth and Ephesus and Rome or anywhere else. It wasn't me. In my weakness, he was my strength. How many times do we transform that? And by transforming it, we make Moses out to be something he wasn't. Jeremiah to be out something he wasn't. Gideon to be something he wasn't. Paul to be something he wasn't. And we look at our own miserable lives as we consider them to be and say, God, I'm just nothing. I don't know how you can use me. Is that the truth? The Holy Ghost comes into the most broken and shattered lives and puts them back together. Listen. It's just the wonderful way that the Holy Ghost does it. He didn't take anybody. At least John, at least John followed Jesus everywhere he went on the night of his trial. John's a great man. He's a lover of Jesus. Jesus loves him. 
John is there. He's not right up beside him, but John is there. He has access to the courts. He has access to the trials. He's following Jesus everywhere he goes. John is standing there at the feet or at the foot of Jesus's cross. John is there holding Jesus's mother. Jesus speaks to John and he says, behold your mother. And he says to his mother, behold your son. I mean, John is there. It's like he's not afraid. He's he's a lamb who wandered but never strayed. He's right there. In the midst of everything, but when it was the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost did not preach through John. He didn't preach through Matthew. He didn't preach through Thomas. He took Peter, who openly denied the Lord of glory. He denied him. He was afraid of him. He didn't want to be associated with him. And Peter, who rejected his God, was the one the Holy Ghost took past his past, took past his failure, took past all the reasons why he could not preach. And he used him as the preacher that day. The Holy Ghost could have used anybody, but he took a failing, miserable disciple who failed in everybody's eyes. Oh, not not to the point of Judas Iscariot, of course, but Peter's failure is recognized as clearly as Judas's was. And the Holy Ghost said to Peter, I want you to preach this message to the people who crucified Jesus, because I want these people to know if I can get you past your past, I can get them past their past who murdered the Lord of glory. And he did, didn't he? Thousands repented, gave their hearts to Jesus Christ, were forgiven for murdering the Prince of Life, and were ushered in into the kingdom of God. You talk about the power of God. What else could do that? What are we going to do to challenge black magic? What are we going to do to challenge the occult? What are we going to do to challenge witches and warlocks? What are we going to do to challenge Hollywood? What are we going to do to challenge the movies that are inundating our young people with witchcraft, vampires, and, and, and the dead, and everything? All of the, what are we going to do? Our nice preaching isn't going to do it. Nice little sermons, nice little talking. God needs prophets today. He needs people that will speak the truth and speak what he gives them to say. And let the Holy Ghost deal with man the way God wants to deal with man. He wants to stir up the venom of the lost. He wants to stir up the passion of the saved. He wants all men to come to one truth. You're either with me or you are against me. The church has clouded that line for too long. We've made it so gray. We've made everybody feel like they're a part of the kingdom of heaven. But everybody is not. And if Jesus is coming soon, I believe as Moses drew the line in the sand, the Holy Ghost is going to use us to draw the line and let people know whether they are in or out with Jesus Christ. And if that's going to happen with your life, you get ready. You get ready. Because you're going to begin to be treated like the New Testament saints were treated and the Old Testament prophets were treated if you speak the Word of God. It's easy to preach a little sermon. Make it so pretty. Let everybody love it. But what does God want to say? What does he want to say? What does he want to do? This is the issue. The Holy Ghost has come so that people all over the world would be able to know the living God and worship Jesus Christ and live forever with God because of the blood of the Lamb. He has come to empower and equip men and women to go all over the world and preach one message. You don't ever have to wonder, what am I going to say? What am I going to preach? You can preach for the rest of your life and never exhaust the wisdom of God and the testimony of Jesus. You can preach the blood every day of your life and the Holy Ghost will use it with power to bring men and women out of bondage, out of darkness and into a relevant walk with Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice in Isaiah 66 in Romans 15, I want to read two passages here. Isaiah 66 He tells us in verse 18, I want you to see this. This is what he comes to do. Humanity is blinded. It's blinded by a devil that has more authority and more power than you as a human could ever possess. What power do you have to challenge that devil? And what power do you have to force that devil to let go of the things that he has deceived? What power do you have? And that only power is the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost authority. Holy Ghost power. Holy Ghost preaching of the gospel of Jesus. He tells us in verse 18, For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come 
that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. That's what God desires. I want people to come. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17? Oh, Father, I pray that they might be with me. And I pray that they would be able to behold the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the earth. I want people to see this, God. I want them to be in it. And here in Isaiah, God is even saying the same thing, that they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them. And I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, to Put, to Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and to Jain and to the owls afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel as they bring an offering in a clean vessel unto the house of the Lord. Now, all of these animals that God mentions are the means by which he, it's, it speaks of how quickly God is going to get all of the people to him. It's just whatever's there that he can get and put the people on. He's going to get them to Jerusalem so that they can be around the throne of God and they can see it. And we understand it would speak of the millennial kingdom of Christ when he comes and, he, and he's reigning and the Gentiles are coming to him. But it speaks also of those who will surround the throne of God, even right now in heaven, from every nation and every tribe and every tongue, that we have gone forth into the world to bring all men to Christ. Well, let me tell you, you didn't go. The Holy Ghost is gone. The Holy, and, and if you've gone anywhere in this world, it's because the Holy Spirit somehow filled you up and brought you. That's all he did. And if you didn't go, it doesn't mean you're a worthless life. It just meant the Holy Ghost filled you so he could use you to send somebody to go. See, it's not somebody's more special than another. It's not those that go are more holy or special than those that don't go. It's the Holy Spirit has to use everybody to make the whole thing work. And he goes into the earth. He's come. He's the witness. He goes into the nations and he pulls people who are blinded by this immoral immortal devil, and he pulls people away from these false gods. He pulls people away from these false religions. He convinces them of the blood of the Lamb. He convicts them that they're sinners, and he convinces them that Jesus is the only Savior, and men and women and boys and girls all over the world fall on their faces before a Jesus they've never known and are introduced to him by the Holy Ghost, and they are suddenly and instantly forgiven, instantly transformed into new lives, who rise up from that as worshipers of God. No other power on earth but the Holy Ghost can do something like that. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, I do want to read this, because I want you to see what the Lord does. Because I want you to see the method that the Holy Spirit used in the Apostle Paul to bring his truth. In Romans 15, verse 19, or verse 18, he says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Now listen, listen to this. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yes, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, because Satan certainly doesn't want this to happen. But I want you to understand, God said in Isaiah 66, where my fame does not exist, I will bring it. The Apostle Paul, years later, 
It says, I don't build upon another man's foundation. Where Jesus has been named, I rejoice in that. But I am going to bring the fame of Christ where he is not mentioned. And the means by which the Holy Ghost uses me to introduce Jesus and bring his fame is through miracles, signs, and wonders. Where did we ever get away from that? Now, I don't believe we have. But as a church, over the last hundred years or more, denominationally, all the way across, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Episcopalians, all the way across, who claim faith through the blood of the Lamb. Where did we get away from that? Where did, where did we come to just think and just desire it to be significant enough just to say words? When the Apostle Paul is saying, by the power of the Spirit of God, through miracles, signs, and wonders. The Apostle Paul said, it has pleased God to magnify His Son in me. What was the motivation of Paul? This one thing I do. I want to know Him. I live to know Jesus. Well, that just simply ties us back that Paul is of the same spirit as Moses, Samuel, all of the others. I want to know Christ, and I want Him through my life to make Himself known in the earth. The fame of God. When a man lives for that reason alone, I believe you'll see the miracles. The signs, the wonders, the power, the conviction, preaching and anointing in the power of the Holy Ghost that melts people and convicts people and deals with people. Where you're speaking to somebody and conviction falls over their faces. When you're so terrified in your weakness that you don't know what to do. And I want to witness, but I don't know how to talk to people. And I just don't know what I'm going to do. But I'm going to go up there and I'm just going to start. And I'm going to believe the Holy Ghost to give me the words to say. And you do it. And it was the most incredible moment of your life, wasn't it? I was with Becca. We were walking the streets in the Dominican Republic. And she was with me. I just wanted to take her around that day because I could see in her she wanted so badly to witness to somebody. She just wanted to. So we're walking around. I said, all right, Becca, we're going up to this guy. He's yours. You do it. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. I said, the Lord's going to give you the word. Beautiful. I mean, she opened her mouth. The Holy Ghost started to speak. The man fell under conviction. And he's asking Jesus to be his Savior. But what did it do to her? It transformed her life. She saw what God was able to do through somebody that had nothing to offer God but weakness. It's not methods. It's not money. It's not traditions. It's the Holy Spirit. And without Him, we have nothing. But with him, we have everything. I want to close with this testimony of possibly one of the greatest revivalists that has ever lived. A man who lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, refused to ever minister outside of God's presence. And what I mean by that is he would oftentimes cancel his services because he discerned that something was obstructing himself from the presence of God. That man was Charles Finney. And this is what he said. To the honor of God alone, I will say a little of my own experience in this matter. I was powerfully converted on the morning of the 10th of October. In the evening of the same day and on the morning of the following day, I received overwhelming baptisms of the Holy Ghost that went through me as it seemed to me, body and soul. I immediately found myself endued with such power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were the means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows in the souls of men. They cut them like a sword. They broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes of people can attest to this in my life. Oftentimes, a word dropped without my remembering it would fasten conviction and often result in almost immediate conversion. Sometimes I would find myself, in a great measure, empty of this power. I would go out and visit 
and find that I made no saving impressions, no convictions and no conversions. I would stop everything and I would exhort and pray with the same result. I would then set apart a day for private fasting and prayer, fearing that this power had departed from me and would inquire anxiously after the reason of this apparent emptiness. After humbling myself and crying out for help, the power would return upon me with all of its freshness. This has been the experience of my life. How content are we to be filled for the moment, but not filled for every day? Can you imagine just Finney going along? He just speaks a few words, has no idea what he's saying, no idea what he's doing. And men are cut like a knife. Hearts are smashed as with a hammer. And he didn't even know what was going on. God just moving. God just speaking. God just dealing. Would you like for that to be your life? God's not asking for great people. He's asking for weak people. But he is asking for people who are not afraid. And if you are afraid, he has an answer for that. He'll come upon you and give you boldness. I know I'm speaking to a church filled with many people and different walks of life and different desires. And some people are just content to live their life and go to heaven when they die. And I've had people say, you know, those are messages you need to preach to preachers. You are the ambassador of Jesus Christ. I don't know what you do to make money, but that's not what you do for a living. You're his servant. I challenge you in Jesus' name to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I challenge you in Jesus' name to never be content to just say words, but to believe in the power of the Holy Ghost that can speak through you and believe for signs and wonders and miracles to be done through your life, just like the Holy Spirit did through Paul, just like he did through Peter and John, so that he will have the opportunity to declare through you when you are being tried by men. That Jesus, who was crucified, is now alive. And that's the reason this man's whole. That's the reason that woman sees. That's the reason that family's back together. Because the living God, who died for us, is now alive. I desire that. I desire that with all of my heart, with all of my life. Stand with me. And let's pray. If that's your desire, you just come before the Lord and make it to Him. Offer it to Him. You know, maybe you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but is the power fresh? Is it fresh in your life? Is there the conviction of God through your life? 